Gordon Vidal, famously subject to morning after revisionism, uh, that is a disease of making a very witty and slightly mean observation in the conference in the evening and then suing the newspapers who republish that observation in the morning. <laughs> You may be wondering about the connection of this anecdote to the topic of this event. The connection may not, not be a literal one, but it is intended to bring out the point that this event is recorded and will be put online, and therefore all the amusing observations that you are ready to make will stay with all of us forever. <laughs> My name is Martin Spoperinskis. I'm a lecturer at Faculty of Laws at UCL. And my modest role tonight is to be the chair of this discussion. I will say a few words about the case in setting the context, then I will introduce our speakers and appropriately give them the floor. The case of Ben Karakush against Embassy of the Republic of Sudan and Jana against Embassy of the Republic of Libya. Ben Karakush or short was a case about state availability of state immunity in employment claims brought against embassies. And in simple terms, boiling it down to the very essence, it is a case that may be summarized as Christians three lines zero, which are the three lines that fell. Well the first one was a slightly puny lion, but a line nevertheless, the question whether application of immunity raises an issue of human rights and the Court of Appeal concluded that it did indeed. The other lines were much more serious. The question whether there is an obligation under public international law to provide for state immunity in such cases and after an extensive review of state practice and existing international instruments, the Court of Appeal concluded that it did not. The third lion, we might say, came in from a contiguous pride. It was a lion relating to the consequences of that finding, and European Union law here provided the important remedy of horizontal direct application of the right to fair trial. So no immunity, and that is something that can be applied with immediate effect. Uh, of course, if there are any, any I suppose, leophilically um, oriented people in the audience, you will be happy to know that it is not all for Christians. And on the same day, the same Court of Appeal handed down a different judgment that we will not be touching upon in case of Reyes, a case where uh, the Christians got nothing, immunity was applied, because that was a dispute between the domestic workers and a diplomat. Therefore, a very different regime of immunity that of diplomatic immunity applied. So much for introduction. Let me now introduce our speakers, and I can write it out that they are all learned and distinguished, and they are all members of the UCL law faculty. You might say it's just a different way of making the same point. <laughs> uh, let me introduce them in the order in which they will be speaking. Dr. Virginia Mantovaro is a reader in human rights and labor law, and she has published uh, and contributed to the discussion on the issue. In particular, uh, her edited book on right to work, um, Legal and Philosophical Perspectives, was published earlier this year by Hart. Our second speaker will be Dr. Alex Mills. Alex is a reader in public and private international law, again published widely on these topics, and of particular relevance is his magisterial article in the last year's British Year of International Law on rethinking jurisdiction in international law, where he touches lightly upon the Becker Bush case in an earlier installment. To my left sits Professor Roger O'Keefe. Professor O'Keefe is a chair of public international law. Law has written widely on all imaginable aspects of public international law, but of particular relevance to this case is his contribution, the commentary of the United Nations Convention on Jurisdictional Immunities that he co authored and that has been cited in this particular case. And the concluding speaker is Professor Pete Eckhardt, Professor of European Union Law, again, widely 
published in all aspects of this subsystem of regional international law, <laughs> uh, <laughs> in relation to human rights and European Union law. So we have a full spectrum of experts that will engage us on all relevant aspects of this case. Uh, in procedural terms, um, they each get 10 minutes to speak, and that should leave us with a comfortable 20 minutes for discussion. That should conclude by a quarter past seven. Virginia, the floor is yours. Thank you. Thank you very much, Martin, for inviting me to contribute to, to this discussion. Um, my expertise, as Martin said, is in uh, human rights and labor law, and I've done a lot of research and a lot of writing on domestic workers' issues, like the employees in this case, people that do various household tasks like cleaning, cooking, etc. Um, some of you may have heard me uh, talk about this research before, my most recent research, so apologies if you have. I just wanted to give a more general background because we turn, before we turn to my colleagues that are experts in international and European law, um, um, uh, the main problem that the workers like these face, workers that are uh, migrant domestic workers, and including the diplomatic domestic workers, is that they are tied to a particular employer. Even uh, diplomatic domestic workers that uh, in the past could change employer, they had to stay in the same uh, diplomatic mission. So more, gener more generally speaking, domestic workers are uh, generally a vulnerable group of workers. Uh, um, they work in the privacy of the employer's household. They are very often migrants, and in this, uh, in these cases that we're talking about, they are migrants. So they know little about the country, workers' rights here, and uh, what we mean about talking labor protective legislation. Another problem with uh, domestic workers is what I have called uh, in some uh, research of mine in the past, the legislative precariousness of domestic workers. What I call legislative precariousness of domestic workers is the fact that domestic workers are um, typically excluded from much labor protective legislation, both in the UK and in other legal orders. They're very often excluded from labor inspections. The Health and Safety at Work Act excludes them here. They're sometimes excluded from minimum wage protection, maximum working time, etc. So that's why, by law, they become precarious. The legislative precariousness of domestic workers, this, this uh, problem that I refer to, becomes, uh, comes to an extreme mode with diplomatic domestic workers, where the employer can be, can be um, totally unaccountable for grave violation of labor rights uh, and other human rights. Um, uh, in particular, so, uh, with diplomatic domestic workers, as well as the, the broader category, um, of overseas domestic workers, the problem is that they are tied to their employer. So even if they are very gravely exploited and abused, and they decide uh, to leave their employer, they become undocumented. This issue, so they cannot change employer. This issue has been criticized much both by NGOs and in academic literature and, about, uh, and by legal practitioners specializing in this area. And it has been said that it can lead to situations of modern slavery. There's much discussion on these issues also now in the, against the background of the modern slavery bill. So um, a few months ago, I did an empirical study. I interviewed uh, a, a qualitative study. I interviewed 24 migrant domestic workers that arrived to this country either as diplomatic domestic workers or as, uh, um, or as overseas domestic workers more generally that accompany an employer in the UK. So I interviewed 24 either diplomatic domestic workers or overseas domestic workers to see if there is a pattern of exploitation and abuse and where the tied status of their visas may lead them. So I have completed now my research and I have uh, an article forthcoming on this issue. Um, I, I managed to access these domestic workers through an NGO, Kalle Jan, who was involved in the Reyes case, um, uh, where I'm also on the management board. And Kalle Jan brought me in touch with these domestic workers that I interviewed. And the issues that I, um, I that these, dom these domestic workers that I interviewed reported to me were uh, very, very striking. So, um, um, very often, as you may know, these domestic workers have, uh, they don't have their passports, their employers have their passports because uh, the vi their visa ties them to their employers. Um, uh, if they are employed by the same employer before arriving in the UK, 
their working conditions are very often very poor, so very, very, very low wages, uh, and low days off, uh, no understanding of what uh, a day off is, uh, insufficient nutrition, physical or psychological abuse before they arrive in the UK, right? Uh, or even um, sexual abuse at times. These workers arrive in the UK accompanying a particular employer. For diplomatic domestic workers, there is no requirement that the employment relationship pre-exists. For overseas domestic workers, there is a requirement that the employment relationship pre-exists for a year to provide some protection, some protection from human trafficking mainly. What I found from the interviews of these diplomatic domestic workers and uh, other overseas domestic workers was that uh, some of the interviewees, uh, both diplomatic and overseas, said that they did not want to come to the UK. They felt compelled, uh, they felt that they had to come to the UK for several reasons. Um, uh, they, were in they lived and um, they, stayed, they were in extremely poor work uh, living conditions here. So they, sometimes they did not have their own uh, uh, room in the house, or they slept on the floor. Um, uh, they were, sometimes they were locked in, so they could not leave the household. And uh, some of them told me you know, that they were treated like animals. They only threw food at me, like you give food to an animal. Um, some of them, as I said, were here too, physically, uh, psychologically, or even sexually abused. <laughs> I'm not claiming that this is because of the visa regime, uh, of a particular visa regime. I cannot make such a claim. Um, but what, I, what is observed uh, that is because of this visa regime, they, they feel great dependency on their employers. They are very fearful of the employers uh, because uh, um, the employers like the diplomats, uh, for instance, um, are very powerful people, and uh, these domestic workers are not very powerful people. They are fearful of the authorities, they are afraid to go to the UK authorities, they are afraid to go to the police uh, and uh, to other authorities because of the fear of deportation. They need the job. But the biggest problem, or the problem that these particular visas with which these workers arrive in the UK, is that uh, if they escape these very abusive employers, um, they become undocumented. Um, when they become undocumented, they just uh, they, they, decide, they, they stay here because they are very, very poor and desperate people. Um, they stay in the country and uh, um, they try to find another job. They have nowhere to go. They don't know anything about what are their labor rights? They don't have a, an understanding very often from my uh, own empirical research of what a labor right is. They don't know the details of their visa, but they're desperate to get another job. And what happens, and, it's, uh, and this is where the visa created, this type of visas with which these workers arrive in the UK comes in. Um, uh, what happens is that because of this visa, uh, people become trapped in ongoing cycles of exploitation they try to find another job, but the new employers know that they are desperate, very often they know that they are undocumented, and they continue exploiting them. And it's not only the new employers that exploit them, it's also um, friends of theirs, friends, so-called friends of theirs, and people that try to help them that exploit them. But uh, they don't have, uh, they don't have, there's no way out of this for them. So they cannot, uh, they cannot renew the visa, they cannot uh, become uh, documented, they cannot become documented, they cannot get a, yeah, a new visa in the UK, and in this way they are trapped in ongoing situa situations of exploitation for many years. One of the domestic workers that I interviewed has been here for, since, uh, for more than 10 years, and she became homeless, and she was repeatedly raped, um, uh, in the end, now she has decided to go back home where she came from initially with grave um, uh, health uh, problems, but she has, you know, she told me she has nothing else to lose, so she decided to go back to the country from which she arrived, this diplomatic domestic worker. <coughs> um, I have a paper on these issues if anyone is interested, but as you can imagine, against this background, the Bacon Bush case is a very welcome development for a labor and human rights lawyer 
like I am, uh, specializing on the protection of migrant domestic workers. Um, it gives a message, I guess, that uh, employers of uh, diplomatic domestic workers will not always be unaccountable for violations of basic labor rights and other human rights. I hope it will have also a, a, a deterrent effect uh, because another problem that is an issue with these uh, workers, with these domestic workers, is that most of them will not go to the courts, will not go to the authorities, they don't want to challenge anyone, they just want to continue working and send um, some basic income to their families who are desperately, in desperate need. So I hope that uh, the Banker Bush case um, will uh, um, have such an effect. Uh, and, uh, so I just wanted to, yeah, to present a general background of the ill treatment of migrant domestic workers and diplomatic domestic workers, and I look forward to hearing what my colleagues have to say about uh, international law and immunity and how they view this recent development. Um, thank you, Virginia, and I, I think it's certainly a, a very important reminder about the great importance um, of the policy issues at stake in such cases. Uh, before I do the floor of Alex, uh, perhaps a point that I might have noted earlier, but uh, better later than never, as I understand that uh, the respondents in this case have been given leave to appeal the Supreme Court. So this discussion is not merely of historical interest, but we might be thinking of what arguments uh, may persuade the court, the Supreme Court, to confirm its ru this ruling or to change it. But Alex, the call is yours. Thank you very much. Uh, so I'm going to talk about this case, uh, the Benkhard Bush case, from a very different perspective, from the perspective of public international law. And from the perspective of public international law, this is a decision which is, in some ways, both remarkable and unremarkable. Uh, it's remarkable because it's an important decision, and it's the sort of culmination of, uh, of a very long kind of process of, uh, of challenging rules on state immunity. Um, but also, in many ways, it's just the natural consequence of previous case law. Um, the decision, uh, to me, follows from uh, decisions, previous decisions that have been reached um, by other courts. So, my comment today, uh, I'm trying to put this decision in its broader international law context to explain how it came about and what significance uh, it has as a matter of general international law. So, to do this, I'm going to start with uh, the, the traditional picture of what we call jurisdiction in international law. When we talk about jurisdiction in international law, we mean essentially any exercise in form of state regulatory power. Uh, and the way that this basically works in international law is that states are given permission to exercise jurisdiction on various grounds. Um, jurisdiction in relation to their territory, in relation to their nationals, and so forth. But this permission is subject to prohibitions. So, essentially, jurisdiction in international law is discretionary. It's a matter of state right uh, in this traditional picture, except where prohibited by things like immunities, um, under which, uh, which deal with cases where states can't uh, exercise this jurisdiction. And these general principles on jurisdiction in international law also apply to the role of courts. So, from an international law perspective, when we talk about the jurisdiction of courts, states can exercise jurisdiction through their courts in a range of circumstances uh, in which international law authorizes that. But that's traditionally discretionary, a matter uh, of discretion for the state, unless it's subject to some kind of prohibitive rule, like a rule of state immunity. So we can think of this traditional picture of jurisdiction in international law as a kind of field of discretion for states but with part of the field fenced off by the law of state immunity or other kinds of immunities that are recognized in international law. An area where states uh, can't go in terms of their exercise of jurisdiction. Now, one of the very important implications of this traditional picture of jurisdiction and immunity in international law is that states could grant more immunity than required by international law. To the extent that a state was granting more immunity than was required by international law, it would simply be choosing not to exercise some of its jurisdiction. Uh, and as that jurisdiction is a matter of discretion, it was perfectly within the entitlement of a state to do that, to choose not to exercise some of its jurisdiction uh, in a matter that went 
in a manner that went beyond what was required by international law. So that's the traditional picture. In the last 15 to 20 uh, years, this traditional picture has come under challenge because of a kind of grand conflict between two values in international law. First, state immunity, which essentially respects the sovereign equality of states. Basically, the idea that states or their agents can't be subject to the jurisdiction of another state, can't be brought before the courts of another <coughs> state. Second, the idea of human rights and access to justice, and particularly the right of access to a court under uh, rules like the European Convention on Human Rights, which seeks to protect the interests of individuals rather than the interests of states. And this European right also draws on the broader international law, uh, the doctrine of denial of justice, and the right to a hearing in civil matters under international human rights treaties. Now, there's also been a separate challenge to state immunity from another category of norms in international law, we call Juskomen's norms, peremptory norms in international law, but that's been rejected. Um, perhaps most significant by the International Court of Justice in the Germany v. Italy decision, and it's not what's at stake here in this case, and so I'm not going to say anything more about that. Now this grand conflict that's been happening over the last 20 years has essentially been about trying to change state immunity. It's been about pushing at the fenced off areas of jurisdiction. Can we get access to those areas? Uh, and that succeeded in one case, the famous Pinochet decision of the House of Lords, which found that the universal <coughs> obligation to prosecute under the Torture Convention meant that by necessary implication, state immunity had to give way. But that's in the criminal context. So here we're talking about the civil context, context of civil proceedings rather than criminal proceedings. Now in the civil context, we've also had a whole series of cases trying to push back the boundary of state immunity. In this country and before the European Court of Human Rights, the uh, most prominent decisions have been the al Sani case uh, and the Jones in Saudi Arabia and then Jones v. UK uh, decisions. In each of these cases, it was argued by the claimants that the defendant's <coughs> right of state immunity should give way because of the claimant's right of access to a court. So we've got this sort of conflict directly set up. In each of these cases, that argument has been rejected. Now, it was rejected only very narrowly in al itself by uh, a vote of uh, 9 to 8. But in later cases, the rejection has become clearer. Uh, and in Jones and Saudi Arabia, uh, sort of, Jones in the United Kingdom um, before the European Court of Human Rights, it was rejected six to one. So um, it sort of seems to become quite decisively rejected uh, before the European Court of Human Rights. So why is this argument being rejected? It's been rejected because the courts have found that the right of access to a court is not an absolute right. It's a right which can be restricted if there's a legitimate justification for that restriction. And most importantly, compliance with the law of state immunity is such a legitimate justification. So the efforts to push back the fence of state immunity in the context of civil proceedings have at least so far failed and failed decisively. <coughs> In the battle between state immunity and access to civil justice, state immunity has won. Lions three, Christians zero, as Marx might say. But in the meantime, something else has changed, almost without being noticed. Courts have held that compliance with state immunity justified restricting the claimant's right of access to a court. In so doing, they decided that implicitly, without such a justification, claimants do have to be given their day in court, unless there is some other legitimate justification for denying them access to court. And there are other legitimate justifications like statutory limitation periods, which, which are justifications for denying someone access to the court. But in the absence of something like that, 
Courts have to exercise civil jurisdiction in the absence of a prohibition like an immunity. So the quiet revolution that's taken place has not been any change in the law of state immunity, but a fundamental change in the law of jurisdiction. Jurisdiction has gone from being a matter of discretion, which is subject to prohibitions, fenced off areas. It's become generally, at least as a general matter, and particularly for those states who are part of the European Convention on Human Rights, a matter of obligation subject to prohibitions and subject to exceptions, but nevertheless, as a starting point, a matter of obligation. Now, one of the important implications of this is that you can only deny a claimant access to a court where required by the international law of state immunity or some other form of immunity. In other words, states cannot give more immunity than required by international law anymore. That's a hugely important change from the traditional position. And here's where uh, Ben Kalbush itself comes into play, as in some ways an un unremarkable application of these principles. Roger will say more about this, but essentially the court found that the UK State Immunity Act went beyond what was required by international law. And to the extent that it did so, it could not justify interference with the claimant's right of access to justice. So what this leaves us with is a new picture of jurisdiction and immunity in international law. States no longer have a field of discretion subject to prohibitions. That discretion has been squeezed out by the right of access to justice. States are generally either under an obligation to exercise jurisdiction as a matter of human rights law, or they're under an obligation not to as a matter of immunity law. The consequence of this is that national legal systems, at least, again, if uh, states or parties to the European Convention on Human Rights, have to get their immunity laws more or less exactly right. And in Ben Bush, the court found that the UK State Immunity Act failed to do this. And so the claims to that court indeed still has to be given their day in court. Many thanks, Alex. So I think that was a wonderful outline of the very interesting dynamic of the international legal process. I suppose one thing that is striking is how different the perspective about the likelihood of development is from compared to 2001 and Alexani and poverty, then you still get seen to be the way of the future. Poverty really is something that only one judge could be voting for, and all the times have changed now. Roger. Thank you, Martins. Um, it struck me as I was sitting here and I looked at the little thing here, the brand of this monitor is Lilliput, and I was already feeling bad enough sitting between a very tall Latvian and a very tall Greek, and to be told that I'm the Lilliputian in the room is somewhat embarrassing, I would prefer to think of myself as the Gulliver. Um, some might think of me as the Yahoo. I think the ultimate thing is to consider, be considered the Hulian, because the famous quality of the Hulians in Gulliver's travels is that they never lie. In fact, they do not even have a word for lie. They have an expression, that which is not. So I would like you to believe that everything I'm about to tell you is perfectly true. You haven't been told the facts of the case yet. Okay? Ms. Bonkar Bush and Ms. Jana were domestic workers in the embassy. Okay? They were cooks in the embassy. They were not diplomatic staff. They were not what we call the administrative or technical staff. That is, they were not secretaries. They were not your IT guy who turns up uh -huh, when you need them, the most important person in any um, organization. Nor, on the other hand, were they private domestic servants of the individual member of the diplomatic staff. They were not the manservant, as it were, of the ambassador. Okay, Jeeves or Cato in um, Inspector Clouseau, the guy who jumped out of the refrigerator. 
They, there was something in between. They were cooks for the embassy, employed by the embassy. Now, they alleged a range of breaches of employment legislation, but also unfair dismissal and unpaid wages and all that sort of thing. The problem was suing the embassy, okay, the foreign embassy, is suing the foreign state. Okay, international law uh, has problems with that. Why is that? Well, states are sovereign. What does sovereignty mean? Sovereignty means having no lawful authority above oneself as of right. In other words, you are the boss, no one as of right, you can concede this power to them, but no one as of right may exercise their power over you. Okay? So in traditional way of thinking, one state may not subject another state to the processes of its courts, because to do so is to say, we have power over you. Mm -hmm. And that's a contradiction in terms. States being sovereign must be equal. And the expression given to this in traditional Latin, which of course is not traditional Latin, it was probably invented by some German person in the 19th century, like most traditional Latin expressions, was par in pare non habet imperium. An equal doesn't have power over an equal. Well, actually, and this is the main confusion, actually, with the House of Lords and the court, in this case, where they doubt whether Article 6 is engaged, it's not that they don't have jurisdiction. They have jurisdiction if their courts have, you know, issued the writ or whatever successfully, okay? It's that they may not exercise that jurisdiction. Okay, so the thing is this. International law, in certain circumstances, obliges states to refrain from exercising the jurisdiction of their courts over foreign states. Now, traditionally, this was absolutely everything that the foreign state did. Mm -hmm. However, in time, foreign states began to do lots of stuff that you and I can do, okay? They ran businesses, commercial airlines, this, that, the other, tourist offices, and so on and so forth. And of course, in the communist world, they did everything in the um, economy. And over time, beginning in the late 19th century, culminating really in the 80s, 90s, and ultimately in 2004 from the UN Convention, it was decided that there are some instances in which a state should be treated just like everyone else. Well, what are those instances? We call them acta jure gestionis, more German Latin. Um, those acts by right of, now gestionis is translated as commercial or everyday stuff as distinct from acts that are what we call Ure Imperii, that is, by right of sovereignty. So international law now distinguishes between acts performed by a state which are inherently sovereign. Okay, issuing visas, diplomatic intercourse, setting people into war, all that sort of stuff. Inherently sovereign stuff. In respect of that, the state remains entitled to immunity in foreign courts as a matter of public international law. However, when the state descends into the market, as the language has it, when the state does what you and I can do, mm -hmm, it's a to that. Sounds easy in principle. In practice, however, try applying it. Well, the way things have worked out over the years is that the way it's generally approached is this. There is a presumptive rule of immunity. One state may not subject another state to the processes of its courts, qualified by exceptions. And over the years, precisely what those exceptions are has been a source of great contestation. Now, in 1972, the first codification of this was the European Convention on State Immunity, which was applicable amongst the states of the Council of Europe, although not very many of them are party to it, but the United Kingdom is party to it. And pursuant to that, or in fact in preparation for coming party to it, it passed the State Immunity Act, okay, which effectively gives effect to the European Convention on State Immunity. However, things moved on from there, and after a long and very difficult process, in 2004, the United Nations Convention on Jurisdictional Immunities of States and Their Property was adopted. In many parts, quite obviously in accordance with customary international law. In other parts, much more questionable. Why? Because it was the product of a very drawn out, very difficult negotiation in which there were trade-offs and in which native policy decisions were taken. And so the convention, we have to be careful with it. Some provisions reflect customary international law, 
some don't. Okay, one of the most contested areas is contracts of employment. Now, by and large, it's recognised now that as a general matter, a foreign state is not entitled to state immunity in the courts of another state in respect of proceedings relating to contracts of employment. Why? Because contracts of employment, bog standard stuff, you and I can employ people, okay? Nothing special or inherently sovereign about that. However, it's also recognised that there are exceptions to the exception. Why? Because there are some contracts of employment that relate to inherently sovereign things. The battle in courts across the world over the past 30 years has to be to work out okay, precisely what exceptions there are to the exceptions. In other words, what contracts of employment or what aspects of contracts of employment should continue to attract state immunity because they deal essentially with sovereign stuff and what shouldn't be. And one of the most contested areas is in relation to proceedings to do with activities in embassies. Okay? And that's where we kick off. So, if you can press the show image thing, we have the State Immunity Act 1978. Now, the students think I'm not particularly tech savvy, but look at that. Look at that beautiful line of unicorn up there. Okay. Well, as I said, the State Immunity Act gives respect to the European Convention on State Immunity. Immunity from jurisdiction, Article 1. 1. A state is immune from the jurisdiction of the United Kingdom except as provided in the following provisions of this part of this Act. Okay? And the courts have to give effect to that. Okay? So there is immunity. However, there are exceptions well, from immunity, not so tech savvy that I've yet worked out how to use um, these buttons. It says in Article 4.1, the state is not immune as respects proceedings relating to a contract of employment between the state and an individual <coughs> where a contract was made in the United Kingdom and work is to be wholly or partly performed there. Well, and Kabush and Jana, okay, were performing work in the United Kingdom. Okay? Contract of employment, they were suing in relation to a contract of employment. They got excited. Unfortunately, Article 16, 1A of the State Immunity Act says as follows. Section 4 above, that's what we just saw, contracts of employment exception, does not apply to proceedings concerning the employment of the members of a mission within the meaning of the convention scheduled to the Diplomatic Privileges Act 1964. Fast forward to the Diplomatic Privileges Act 1964, the convention mentioned is the Vienna Convention on Diplomatic Relations. So, what uh, does the term members of a mission mean in the Vienna Convention? Let's have a look. Article 1. 1b. One the members of the mission are the head of the mission and the members of the staff of the mission. Okay. So, who are the members of the staff of the mission? C. The members of the staff of the mission are the members of the diplomatic staff, of the administrative and technical staff, and of the service staff of the mission. And if you go down to G, the members of the service staff are the members of the staff of the mission in the domestic service of the mission. Cooks, etc., etc. To be distinguished from the group below them, the private servant. A private servant is a person who is in the domestic service of a member of the mission and who is not an employee of the sending state. That's Jeeves, that's Cato, okay? The manservant who shaves you and shines your shoes, okay, whereas Benkabush and Jana were members of the service staff. Therefore, according to the State Immunity Act, Section 4 didn't apply. Section 4 embodies an exception, so the exception didn't apply. Therefore, Article 1 1 applied, the state was immune. Okay? That's how it was uh, read. Before, of course, we had the developments that Alex told us. So, in this case, the court was obliged to consider whether the grant of immunity to all members of the staff of the mission, that is including members of the service staff, 
was obliged by international law. If it was not obliged by international law, it represented a disproportionate inroad into the right of access to a court protected by Article 6 of the European Convention on Human Rights. What then did they have to do? They had to ask whether generally accepted principles of state immunity recognised an exception to the exception in relation to contracts of employment as regards members of the service staff of the mission. Okay? The European Convention on State Immunity did not help them much in this regard. And they looked, as the latest word on the matter, to the United Nations Convention on Jurisdictional Immunities of States and Their Property, 2004, not yet in force. They carefully noted that we cannot take it for granted that every provision is consonant with customary international law, but they went on to look at it. And it is crafted the way we saw the State Immunity Act is crafted. Article 5 says the state enjoys immunity in respect of itself and its property from the jurisdiction of the courts of another state, subject to the provisions of the Convention. Well, one of the provisions of the Convention, which forms an exception to a state's immunity from foreign jurisdiction, is Article 11, Contracts of Employment. Article 11, 1. Unless otherwise agreed, as otherwise agreed between states concerned, a state cannot invoke immunity from jurisdiction before a court of another state, which is otherwise competent, in a proceeding which relates to a contract of employment between the state and an individual for work performed or to be performed in whole or in part in the territory of that other state. So far, so good. An exception to state immunity in relation to contracts of employment. But, paragraph two, exceptions to the exception, paragraph one does not apply if, and the relevant exception to the exception in this case is to be found in subparagraph B which provides your menu of possibilities. The bottom line being, a state is entitled to continue to enjoy immunity, even in relation to proceedings relating to a contract employment, if the employee is one, a diplomatic agent, as defined in the Vienna Convention on Diplomatic Relations. What's a diplomatic agent? Diplomatic agent in Article 1, E, it's the head of the mission or a member of the diplomatic staff of the mission. So the members of the service staff are not diplomatic agents. So Ben Bush and Co. do not qualify here. Consular officer, no. Member of the diplomatic staff of a permanent mission to an international organisation, etc. Or, and here's the rub, Roman numeral 4, any other person enjoying diplomatic immunity. Well, Sudan and Libya said members of the administrative and technical staff and members of the service staff of the mission do enjoy diplomatic immunity, therefore the contract of employment exception does not apply. However, read that provision closely. B. One, a diplomatic agent the other menus, and then down to four, any other person enjoying diplomatic immunity. If four were to apply to the administrative and technical staff and to the service staff, there would be no point in having one. One would be redundant, because four would include one, anyone enjoying diplomatic immunity. And there's a cardinal canon of treaty construction that you don't uh, interpret a treaty in such a way as to render a particular provision redundant. Even more compellingly, the whole drafting of Article 11 shows that the choice in Article 11b1 of diplomatic agent was absolutely deliberate. The deliberate choice was taken to exclude members of the service staff from the exception to the exception. Bottom line is, the choice was taken by the drafters of the UN Convention to deny a state immunity in relation to proceedings having to do with the contract of employment for the service staff of the mission. And the court was prepared to accept, okay, that looks pretty good. But then they went on to see what state practice 
further beyond the convention set, just to clarify this. And state practice is all over the place. Some states do as the U UK does, and they say anything to do with the diplomatic mission is off limits. Some states say, well, it depends on the precise job of the person. It's a spy on the one hand, uh -huh. and then there's the cleaner on the other. And then there's some states at the other end and say, even with the spy, okay? If the spy is just doing bog standard stuff, like selling something, okay, then you can examine it in the courts. There's no immunity. If the spy is spying, there's immunity. Looking at all of this, the court said, well, one thing we can conclude from this mixed picture is that international law does not require immunity in this context. It does not require it. And to that extent, I think the court was absolutely right. The international law does not, I think, require the according of state immunity in proceedings having to do with the contract of employment of the service staff of the mission. However, the court acknowledged that these questions are not always clear. And the standard they sought to apply was whether the argument was tenable, whether it was reasonable, or it could reasonably be maintained, even though the better view was that there was no immunity. Could it reasonably be maintained that there was immunity? And here, I think, perhaps the court was a little tough. At the same time, I think the court's view was itself tenable. And they said, no, the UK's position is now untenable. To say that all members of the mission and their contracts and blah, 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 enjoy immunity is beyond what is these days considered the number of reasonableness in that regard. Okay. That was one. The second point, which I won't dwell on hugely, one of the people was not permanently resident in the United Kingdom at the point of entry to contract the treaty. Why is that relevant? Well, what is the justification for the UK meddling in the employment affairs of the foreign state? Well, the justification is it occurs on the territory, first of all, of the United Kingdom, and the person is not a national of the foreign state. And, well, here's the problem. The European Convention on State Immunity says if there is to be the exception in relation to contracts of employment to be the person must be habitually resident in the state when they entered into the contract. And Mrs. Janar was not habitually resident in the United Kingdom. On the other hand, no such rule is found in the UN Convention. So the question before the court, was such a rule required? And they looked at the UN Convention and said, it's not there. And they looked around at state practice and they said, well, not too many states engage this rule. Mm -hmm. Therefore, they said it's not required. Putting it simply, they said, the European Convention on State Immunity to this extent is now out of step with public international law as subsequently developed. And what they require the United Kingdom to do, well, they don't require it, of course, they have the a declaration of incompatibility or whatever, or European law remedies. But basically, the upshot is that the United Kingdom will not be permitted, because of the European Convention on Human Rights, mm -hmm, to comply with its treaty obligations under the European Convention on State Immunity. Now, as a matter of public international law, why? Why? But as a matter of, as far as the regime, if one wants to call it that, of the European Convention on Human Rights is concerned, the answer is Article 6. But it seems not to have been something that really caused them to pause and reflect in that regard. Mm -hmm. Interestingly enough, of course, both of those treaties are from the same system, the Council of Europe system. So the same one treaty of the Council of Europe system trumps another treaty of the Council of Europe system. Okay. So quite a striking feature of the case which no one has really thought a lot about. Nonetheless, that was that. In the end, they said, on both grounds, 
The State, Immun uh, the, the State Immunity Act um, is out of step with generally accepted rules of public international law. The State the United Kingdom is not required to accord immunity in this situation. Therefore, we have a disproportionate limitation on the right of access to the court, and they acted accordingly. Um, so, I hope you believe that, given that I am uh, either a little Christian or a union, and I'll hand over to former Martins first as the giant of these proceedings. Thank you. Um, well, I think it is appropriate that after having dissected these issues of mind-boggling complexity, we go to a regime that actually works and matters in European law. Thank you very much, Martin. I was extremely grateful when you asked me to say a few words about the EU law side of, uh, of the dispute, although it's invariably with great trepidation that as an EU lawyer, I address an audience of public international lawyers, as of course EU law is only a subsystem of uh, international law uh, and much inferior to the uh, sophistication of, uh, of international law, which can be seen in the judgment. Uh, the EU law analysis comes at the end of the judgment. <laughs> It's much shorter than the international law analysis. It's much more sweeping. The uh, court simply uh, looks at the fact that some of the employment rights which were claimed by the claimants were uh, rights under European directives, European law, even racial discrimination, a matter of European law, so that to that extent these matters were within the scope of EU law and therefore also within the scope of the EU Charter of Fundamental Rights which uh, is a kind of afterthought to the European Convention uh, on Human Rights, of course. It contains the Convention rights, plus some social and economic rights, uh, usually only boiled down to the right to strike, at least uh, in the media here. So the Charter applied, it has the right to an effective uh, remedy in it, and uh, the Charter has a horizontal direct effect. It applies not just in relation to the... Uh, in relation to uh, claims made by individuals against the member state or the EU institutions, it may in some cases also apply horizontally. <coughs> and on the basis of that rather well, unsophisticated analysis, the claimants actually do have uh, some rights to, to make their claims in courts, which is not the case pursuant to the Convention, because all that the courts there can do is to uh, make a declaration of incompatibility. So it's all really rather unsophisticated on the EU law side. Uh, I think there was scope for uh, uh, some, some greater sophistication. Uh, certainly the question of uh, horizontal direct effect of the EU Charter could have been uh, explored uh, at some greater depth. I think uh, the, there's only a couple of paragraphs on it. Uh, I have a PhD student, uh, Virginia, and I have a PhD student here at, at UCL who's trying to write a thesis about, about the question, and it certainly deserves that thesis. Uh, so she, she's very enthusiastic about the judgment, of course, because <laughs> in favour of the horizontal effect. What the Court of Appeal does is simply refer to a couple of quite famous cases in EU law, Mangold and Kuchip Devici, which uh, in fact predates the Charter, uh, where the uh, European Court of Justice found a way around the lack of horizontal direct effect of directives by saying that uh, directives uh, on age discrimination actually embody a general principle of European Union law and that uh, as such they can be given also horizontal effect which is not normally the case with an unimplemented uh, directive. Uh, by contrast there's also a more recent case law uh, in the social policy field, social rights field on consultation of workers, uh, EMS, where the European Court of Justice had in fact denied horizontal effect to the Charter but that's a provision in the Charter which requires implementation in national law, so that's the distinction which the uh, Court of Appeal uh, operates and says this is different with the right to an effective remedy. Um, I think that approach is, is a little too sweeping in the sense that, uh, in fact, all of the Charter rights are general principles of European Union law. Uh, the Charter was uh, originally drafted as an attempt to kind of codify the protection of fundamental rights, which there already was in European Union law, as general principles of, of European law. So to say that it is sufficient to find that a charter right is a general principle of European law, which is the, the reasoning which the court employs, right to an effective remedy as a general principle of EU law, would, would render all of the charter essentially horizontally uh, applicable. 
uh, a further uh, slight difficulty with which one might see with the reasoning is to say this was actually a horizontal case because it's a case about uh, 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 individuals uh, which individuals have brought against uh, embassies, against sovereign states, be it non-EU states. Uh, so the non-EU states uh, apparently in the context of applying <coughs> EU law are put at the same level as a private employer and regarded as a, the relationship is regarded as, as horizontal. Um, but that notwithstanding, I, I think actually the application of the charter to uh, a case like this uh, and the, the, the uh, application in particular of the right to an effective remedy to a case like, it, like this is essentially right under European Union law. Uh, I think you, you do not even need the Charter of Fundamental Rights for that because uh, even prior to the Charter, which confirms the right to an effective remedy, we've always had uh, general principles of European law applying in the sense of allowing uh, the enforcement of EU law rights normally under conditions of what is called national procedural autonomy, which means that EU law doesn't harmonize remedies throughout the European Union, but there's always been two basic exceptions to national procedural autonomy, uh, one, that remedies cannot discriminate against claims based on EU law, and the other, that there must be some remedy. Uh, and of course, if you argue immunity from jurisdiction, there simply isn't any remedy. So even if you go back to the uh, good old age of uh, European law, simply looking at remedies from that perspective of, uh, on the one hand, national procedural autonomy, but on the other hand, the principle that where there are rights under European law, in this case, employment rights, that there must be uh, at least some effective remedy. That it must not be unduly difficult or wholly impossible for a claimant to make claims. Would already have gotten you there to finding that uh, in these cases uh, a remedy must be given and immunity uh, cannot be uh, accepted. Uh, that, that does not mean that U European Union law doesn't uh, recognize uh, the rest of international law as a superior system. Uh, there are, uh, of course, uh, intense debates about the extent to which the EU Court of Justice is willing to give way uh, in some cases to uh, applying principles of, of international law, but in fact there has already been an earlier case by the European Court of Justice coming from Germany where, where the EU Court of Justice said uh, in a similar context it was uh, actually uh, EU employment rights, it was the, the rules of jurisdiction, uh, EU rules on jurisdiction which were in issue, but where the European Court already said international law makes the distinction to which Roger referred, uh, you would just just journeys compared to Yuri uh, Imperi, and so uh, there isn't actually an international law obstacle to, uh, uh, to uh, uh, establishing jurisdiction. And of course, you know, since the Kandi litigation, that the European Court of Justice really doesn't like an immunity from jurisdiction based on international law. Uh, my last point is simply, of course, that, that the case uh, uh, clarifies an enormous difference between the effect of the EU Charter of Fundamental Rights, even though it may only be an afterthought to the Convention, and the operation of the Convention itself uh, within the law of the United Kingdom, in the sense that uh, there was clear legislation the Court of Appeal considered in the, in the United Kingdom, which established immunity, and so all that was possible was to issue a declaration of incompatibility with the Convention, uh, by contrast with the EU Charter, it's uh, supreme EU law and it simply overrides any conflicting uh, domestic law. And so that's the uh, very sweeping and unsophisticated uh, ultimate outcome of the case, at least at the level of the Court of Appeal. Uh, we will see whether those questions are litigated again uh, before the Supreme Court. Thank you. Many thanks, Pete. Um, now we have. Uh, we, we've had the opportunity to ask uh, the questions. Let me just note as, as a procedural matter, uh, we have microphones here. We do not have microphones there. Therefore, I will summarize very briefly and I'm sure accurately the questions uh, that you will ask so that they remain there for posterity. <laughs> Please, questions. Hi, I'm Craig Barker, um, London South Bank University. Uh, um, I 
welcome a lot, I think I agree generally with a lot of what you said, I particularly welcome Roger's very clear distinction between the state immunity and the diplomatic immunity, and that is one of the key parts of it. Um, I'm a little bit concerned about your presentation, sorry, I've forgotten your name, um, the, the, the point about, you know, sort of lumping, and I've got to be very careful here, because when you start questioning human rights or domestic servants, you've got to be careful, but there must be a distinction between the private servants of diplomats who have the immunity and those domestic workers. That was just something, and, and, and lumping it all together doesn't make that distinction, and I was a little bit concerned about that. But it, my, my real question comes back to the European Union issue, which is, and perhaps I've just got this wrong, and perhaps it was dependent upon the interpretation of the State Immunity Act as somehow being um, in the past and now changed. What does the European Charter say about diplomatic immunity in relation to employment of uh, domestic servants by diplomats? Because if, if what I think you're saying is correct, that the EU employment rights take precedence, then that's a massive, massive attack on not state immunity, but diplomatic immunity. And one of the things that I've been trying to do over the last 20 years is make a fundamental <coughs> distinction between state and diplomatic immunity and treating them very differently. So I just welcome some comments from the group on that. Thank right. you. So Professor Barber made three points. He uh, welcomed the distinction drawn between state immunity and diplomatic immunity in Roger's presentation. I think that that was really the starting point for both questions to Virginia wondering whether it might not make sense to draw a sharper distinction between uh, different uh, different issues uh, that uh, embassy related workers uh, may be dealing with and in relation to Pete uh, questioning whether the implication of the proposition that EU employment necessarily requires availability of some remedy not sweep away all law of diplomatic immunity. Um, shall we? Uh, yes. Um, thank you for your question. I do not welcome Roger's uh, distinction between uh, state immunity and diplomatic immunity. Um, some of these workers uh, that we're talking about, they don't know at all, most of them, probably all of them, they don't know at all if they're employed by um, a diplomat or the embassy. So for the individual worker, this distinction does not make sense. Uh, um, and when we're talking about grave violations of fundamental labor rights or human rights, I don't think that the, um, any, um, the, what category of employer committed it makes it, uh, uh, should uh, lead to, di to different treatment of the claim. So what uh, brings all these workers together, diplomatic domestic workers, uh, domestic workers that work at embassy or diplomatic domestic workers and other workers that are tied to the employer is exactly the fact that they are tied to the employer. The fact that most of the times the employers are very powerful people, particularly in the case of diplomats, but also other employers that bring to this country their domestic workers for short visits. And in terms of, you know, in the eyes of a human rights and labor lawyer, which is what I am, um, this is how you should be, and one should be looking at these questions. Uh, so, um, we're talking about violations of uh, fundamental uh, uh, labor and other human rights, and we should not be distinguishing on the, or, or, uh, on the basis of who the employer was. But, but the law does distinguish. International law, yes. Not it's like domestic law, sorry. No, uh, yeah, uh, yes, in the way that it has been incorporated here, yes, but I mean, the human rights law, Article 4 of the European Convention on Human Rights applies to everyone within the contracted state's uh, jurisdiction. Article 3 in human, uh, so slavery and servitude, some of these people are victims of human trafficking. Um, uh, in human integrating treatment, all these provisions apply to everyone within the contracting state's jurisdiction. So they don't distinguish between um, different categories of workers. I'm also concerned about access to justice, the issue of access to justice. I think the Inter-American Court of Human Rights has an advisory opinion that says how important access to justice is, generally speaking, and also particularly because sometimes if you don't have access to justice, claims that involve absolute rights, like in human integrating treatment or slavery and servitude, like uh, some of these people do, 
will never be heard. So I'm not very happy with simply saying that uh, the right of fair trial is not an absolute right, because in this way you bar people that have claims to absolute rights from uh, being heard. Yes, yes, I think that that is the substance and procedure and immunity that is an old and long-running debate in international law. Pete? Uh, thank you very much for the question. I mean, of course, the, this is a judgment of the Court of Appeal here. It's not a judgment of the EU Court of Justice, and uh, I don't think there's uh, sufficient authority uh, as of today to, to be able to really give a conclusive answer to, to your question. Um, but it does seem to me that the reasoning of the EU Court of Justice would probably be along the lines of saying that, of course, the European Union aims to respect international law in, uh, in the way in which the, uh, the treaties and even the charter would be uh, interpreted, uh, but then you would need to look at what international law is in fact binding on the European Union, and the European Union has concluded no conventions, to my knowledge, on, on immunity, so it would be customary international law. So I think the court might only find that if really conclusively customary international law really precludes uh, jurisdiction, that uh, the right to an effective remedy would not would not uh, would not be triggered, and I I'd be really quite doubtful that the EU Court of Justice would ever reach that conclusion in these kinds of cases. Where I think that the thinking would be more on the lines of what Virginia, uh, was saying that these are very significant human rights issues which ought to come in the immunity grounds. Right, and Roger has asked for a yeah, um, short intervention. Sure, sure, sure. I, I, uh, I just want to address um, some of what Virginia said, but before doing so, I think we have to make a few factual and legal clarifications. Um, uh, there is a factual and legal difference between the domestic staff of the embassy and the personal servants of the ambassador, as we saw in the convention. Okay, a private servant is one thing, and the members of the service staff. Uh, um, not all members of the service staff, and indeed not all private servants, but not all members of the certain, uh, service staff are recruited. Um, abroad, indeed, both of these people in these cases, neither of them was re recruited in the home country, they were recruited in the United Kingdom, these people. Um, and many people these days, and this is in fact exactly why um, uh, employment contract exception came about, um, foreign states employ local people mm -hmm, as a range of things. So, so we're not necessarily all talking about people trafficking and blah, 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 blah. The distinction between um, diplomatic and immune, immunity and state immunity it seems that Virginia, um, with, I mean, I'm, I'm not accusing you of anything, uh, you, quite rightly your concern is, um, you know, with the fundamental rights of people concerned and their access to justice. Diplomatic immunity does not stand in the way, okay? Let me explain to you how diplomatic immunity does not stand in the way. It is one thing to sue the diplomat, as happened in Reyes. Mm -hmm. And what international law says is, in civil proceedings, except for a very, very narrow range of exceptions, the diplomat is immune. Why is that? The justification of the diplomatic immunity in international law is wholly separate from state immunity. State immunity is a logical proposition. One sovereign cannot have immunity over another. Putting that in, in, in policy terms, one state you know, can't analyse the sovereign acts of another state, and in judgment. It, in a sense, comes down to equality, whereas diplomatic immunity is simply pragmatic, as the International Court of Justice has said. It's good to talk, as Bob Hoskins said, you know, if we want states to continue then, uh, to, to have intercourse with each other, then the diplomats have to be <coughs> Well, the way that is resolved in international law and in the law of this country is as follows, okay? When the diplomat okay, tortures you or something like that, uh, or, you know, uh, abuses you in a, in a, in a domestic context, um, the, a range of possibilities are open to you. While that person is still the diplomat, uh, you can still sue their state as vicariously liable for the acts of the diplomat. Mm -hmm. Although there may be bars of state immunity, but nonetheless, the possibility is open. And as we've seen in these cases, there is no bar of state immunity. Okay. Secondly, the diplomat goes home at some point. The diplomat goes home remarkably more quickly if an NGO tells the Foreign Office that there has been human trafficking. And lo and behold, the Foreign Office declares the person persona non grata. The person is no longer diplomatic credit to that place. All the person is therefore entitled to state immunity, and there's exceptions to state immunity. So in the end, 
diplomatic, it's an illusion that diplomatic community stands in the way of fundamental justice to these people. You either sue the state as vicariously liable for the acts of the diplomat, okay? Now, there may be exceptions, there may not be exceptions, okay? But there's going to be no greater or lesser immunity than would otherwise be the case under state immunity. Or, when the person is no longer the diplomat, as has happened in lots of cases, including a few years ago in this country, you sue the person for acts done. And, in fact, in many of these cases, the person has not even been acting in an official that is a public capacity at the time in hiring the person. Yes, so it's not even a prima facie question of state immunity. Although I have to say that those cases are some of the richest and most contested jurisprudence around the world at the moment. When, a, when an ambassador hires a private servant, is that something done in a public capacity, that is an official capacity or not? And there's arguments on either side. Oh, they cook at the uh, amb uh, ambassador's residence, the ambassador has other ambassadors around, Therefore, they're, you know, helping the ambassador in the ambassador's official capacity. Uh, and sometimes the courts have said, well, no, this person didn't cook, they just cleaned the shoes and cleaned this. So it actually comes down to some fairly finely grained distinctions. But the bottom line I'm trying to get across here is that diplomatic immunity is not a fundamental bar to access to the courts. Depends on whom you cook for. No, it doesn't depend on whom you cook for. But even better if you cook for the ambassador in a personal capacity when they go home. No state immunity, because they did it wholly privately. And a very exciting topic, and I think that if, if, if there are questions that are still out there, we could we could we could collect them and give another round of opportunities to answer. It's, I suppose the temptation of light refreshments is an impossible one to resist, but uh, <laughs> uh, intellectual refreshments uh, should not be maligned. Any, uh, Please. I have a question. Um, my name is Stephanie Milano, I'm a litigator. It's a question about uh, jurisdiction and um, its evolution between uh, being a discretionary power to becoming a, an obligation. Do you think it would have an impact on how a judgment would be enforced in the UK, which was rendered in another jurisdiction, which in a way did not respect state immunity? Do you um, think the UK could enforce such a judgment? Right, so the question related um, to the possibility of enforcing a judgment for, for, an, for a country that has not respected state immunity. I wonder whether we could, as it, as it were, collect um, two or three questions um, and to, as it were, take them together if there are any. Um, right. Well, I imagine that that was directed at Alex. Uh, so I think, um, if, I, if I remember correctly, there is a provision in UK law which, uh, under which a judgment obtained from a foreign state in breach of state immunity is unenforceable, um, as things stand. Uh, the question would be whether these types of principles or arguments could be raised uh, against that. Um, I. Um, I, I don't know that they. I don't know that they could. Um, I mean, they could be raised if you had a situation uh, where um, a foreign state had given immunity beyond what was required by international law, um, and it was argued that that was some, that that gave rise to some kind of um, uh, issue of stopper which prevented proceedings in the UK. That that I could see sort of potentially being some kind of argument. But, um, but not the converse. If a, if a foreign state uh, had not given immunity when they should have, um, then then I don't think that, that same issue would apply. Um, the, the European Court of Human Rights has looked at the impact of um, access to a court on the enforceability of judgments. Uh, it's looked at that issue domestically, um, rather than in terms of cross-border enforcement of judgments. As part of access to a court, access to a remedy, that also means access to enforcement mechanisms. Um, but I don't think that would go so far as to uh, affect obligations to recognise immunity where those obligations do exist under international law. I think the court would apply the same kind of uh, exceptions that it's recognised in the case law that we've seen where um, 
compliance with the international law rules on immunity is a legitimate reason for um, not giving access to justice in a particular case. Um, yeah, can I chip in there? The position under UK law is diametrically opposed to the position under public international law. And the UK law is the opposite. Under UK law, they apply what would have been the situation in the foreign court, whereas under public international law, the enforcement of the judgment is as much an exercise of jurisdiction as proceedings have an issue, as was made clear by the International Court of Justice in the Germany Italy case. So, as far as international law was concerned, mm -hmm, the UK court would have to treat the enforcement of the judgment as if it were proceeding in those courts. Uh -huh. And there, as Alex said, the same principles would be applicable. However, the UK legislation is a bit twisted in that regard, as I think maybe the Canadian is too, where they actually say, what would the situation have been in the foreign court? Now, in most cases, there's no difference, but it is where the exception is based on, pub, uh, on personal injury caused within the jurisdiction. The UK court would say, the relevant jurisdiction in that regard is the US, if it was personal injury in the US, whereas international law would say, no, 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 the UK courts have to ask, was personal injury caused in the UK? And this was precisely the question in the Germany-Italy case, because Italy enforced judgments from Greece. And they said, well, the Greek courts said there's no immunity. Mm -hmm. Whereas in the International Court of Justice said, the Italian courts have to start from scratch. They have to say, is there an exception to immunity to our jurisdiction. And in that case, the fact that personal injury was caused in Greece was utterly irrelevant to the Italian courts. I think the International Court of Justice was wrong on that point, actually. No, I think it was right, and that's how actually it's been seen in the drafting of the, um, of the, of the UN Convention, because they say, you, know, if you just think about it, the, act, the court at that point must at least engage with the case to do something. It must stand in judgment on something. And so just as extradition proceedings are an exercise of criminal jurisdiction, I would say that the enforcement of a judgment is uh, the exercise of civil jurisdiction in, in, in much the same way. But I think it's perfectly reasonable to argue both sides. Yeah. Well, I think that this may be an, app an appropriate moment when we have everybody disagreeing, when there, are, <laughs> there is no agreement even among international lawyers to note uh, that uh, we have been privy to a very rich discussion, as of course the whole world will be privy in a few days, and uh, ask you to join me in thanking the speakers in a customary fashion.